Amen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen who sang. Certainly appreciate those songs. Let's take our Bibles back to Proverbs chapter 4. Finish looking at our thought this morning, from this morning about the five simple steps to keep your heart. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 again says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Father, we ask again for your blessings upon the preaching of your word. Lord, we know that your word will not return void. We know that it is the power. We know that it is through hearing this word that faith comes. We pray that, Father, as the word goes forth, that you would put the power in it, that you would put the unction in it, that, Lord, you'd help me to say exactly what you once said, that you might receive all glory and honor in it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. So as we've been saying, as we've studied through this series on the heart, that the heart is the center of the activities of our life, and it is the battleground that uh, we must be fighting it. Uh, You know, it doesn't... An enemy, I'm just thinking about this, an enemy does not normally try to pick the best battleground for his enemy. He tries to pick what's best for him, not for the enemy. And so, you know, even today at the jail, there was an inmate that, as I finished preaching, uh, brought up the question. He said, you know, I, I'm trying to live right, and it seems like I try and I try and I always fail. He says, uh, says, I feel like Paul when Paul said, the things I would, I do not, and the things I would not, that I do. And I basically said, join the club, amen, where that's the battle. That is spiritual warfare. And, of course, gave him some things to hopefully help him in that. But uh, the the, the mind is a difficult battle. I mean, you can't reach in there and just switch things off. You can't get in there and just tune things out. Things come up when you least expect it and you least want it. Things of the past, things that you shouldn't have put in there, but you did. uh, You know, it's there for life. It is the supercomputer. Amen. It is there for life. And the best we can do is to pray and seek the Lord saturate ourselves in scripture so that it is pushed further and further and further back in memory but here's the deal it will continue to pop up every so often the things in our minds whether it be hardships failures evil thoughts evil deeds bitterness strife whatever it is pride it's going to pop up and we've got to fight the fight so we saw that as we uh want if we want to keep our heart that we must fortify it there in verses 20 and 22 through 22. Then we saw in verse 24 that we have to flush it. Uh, we've got to do that surgical procedure of flushing out the problems, but we must also flush out the people that do not help us to have a good uh, heart, a good mind for God. But then we want to move on to verse 25. He says uh, uh, there, let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. We see here in verse 25 that the third step to keep our heart is to focus our heart. Focus our heart. Notice here what he says, let thine eyes look right on. What does he mean by that? Look right on it. Right now, I am looking right on Pearl. Amen? I I wasn't deviating left or right. I'm looking right at her. And that's what the Bible's telling us to do. We have got to find what is the thing that we're supposed to look right on. Does anybody have a clue what that thing or person might be? Jane, what's the person? Christ. Did she say the cross? 
The cross, and that, that's right, because on the cross, we're seeing Jesus, amen? But Jesus ain't on the cross, praise God. He did uh, die on the cross, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. But in the cross, we understand our Savior. But we're to look to Christ. The Bible says that we are to uh, uh, press toward the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That takes a focus. Those of you who have been runners, who have uh, done the different types of, of uh, races out there, you realize that there's a focus that must be had uh, 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 ahead of you. If you start focusing to the left or the right, you're going to end up tripping and falling. You're going to end up uh, 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 missing the mark that you're looking for. But you've got to be focused. And as I've preached and many others have preached so many times, we must be focused on Christ. As we sang tonight, so many wonderful songs about our Savior. You know, the, problem that, that we, the problems we have in life, they are the things trying to get our focus off the Savior. What has happened in our church, Satan is trying to get our focus as a church off the Savior. Problems of, of health, finances, family, work, all those things. God or the devil is trying to get our focus off of Jesus. We've got to focus. And so in this verse, he says there, let thine eyes look right on. He's talking about concentrate on what is right. What is right? Right. Now, I didn't think about it as I was studying. There, you know, it's funny how sometimes you're preaching and things start popping in that you're like, why didn't I think of that while I was studying this? But the Bible tells us some of the things that we're to concentrate on that really when we concentrate on them, we're concentrating on Christ. Things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are of a good report. All of those in that list there, those are things that really focus us on Jesus because he is pure. He is holy. He is right. We need to concentrate on what is right. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Think about that. We can't see with the physical eye Jesus Christ, but he is the eternal. Everything eternal is really wrapped up in him. Heaven, the street of gold, the river of life, the tree of life, the throne of God. Everything that we think of eternal life, the mansions, it's all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Without him, we have no eternity. And so we've got to stop focusing on the temporal. What is the temporal things? The world. The processes of this world. The politics of this world. Again, there are things that we can look at that aren't sinful necessarily. We need to be aware of, but we shouldn't focus on them. Our family. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to focus on family? No. We're supposed to focus on Jesus. If we have our focus on Jesus, Jesus is going to help us to have, do what's needed for our family. Amen? I say it again, when it comes to marriages, I've given the illustration before that a preacher gave us at a marriage conference of the triangle. Jesus is at the top. The husband and wife are on the other ends. It takes three to have a good marriage. It's Jesus and the wife and the husband. But they are complete opposites many times. Amen. And they're on different ends of the spectrum. But the Bible says we're supposed to be one flesh. How do we do that? By the husband and the wife focusing on Jesus and getting closer to Jesus. And as they get closer to Jesus, they get closer to each other. They become that one flesh. My wife and I experienced that. When I went to Oregon 
on recruiting duty. I had just gotten saved. I was not a good husband. Amen. I had just gotten saved. There are a lot of things I was battling in my life. I was very selfish and self-centered. My wife was not even saved yet. She got saved the first Sunday we got to Oregon. And uh, I'm working just about seven days a week. Every once in a while, I was off on Sunday, but mostly working seven days a week in church very little, so was not growing like I should and was and was still just full of selfishness. And, and so in three years of recruiting, my wife almost left me twice, and I didn't even know it. Thank God he kept us together. We get back to... North Carolina, back to kind of a a normal routine, and I'm in church often, and God is starting to really work in my heart, and and I'm starting to see my selfishness. I'm starting to see uh, how weak I am. I'm starting to see how uh, sinful I am, and I start having a desire for Jesus, and I start focusing on Him, and I start trying to work my life closer to Him, and I didn't know it, but my wife is over here having the same thing happen to her. God is working in her heart. She's focusing on him, and she's trying to move closer to him. And all of a sudden, one day, we looked at each other, and we're like, wow, we got a great marriage. We didn't do all kinds of self-help books. We didn't do all this and all that. We just focused on the Savior, and it happened. We need to concentrate on what is right, and what is right is Christ the eternal. But then he says there, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Now I've got to admit, it took me a while of thinking about this and pondering it. I, I, you know, I'm not big on going to uh, uh, the, uh, what do you call them? To commentaries. I'm not big on going to commentaries because half the time I don't agree with them anyway. Amen? But, uh, I went to my, my favorite commentary that I normally will use, Matthew Henry, and he doesn't even talk about this part of the verse, amen? It's like, well, I don't understand, so I'll write a commentary and just skip these things, amen? But uh, I'm studying, I'm meditating, I'm asking God, Lord, please, I'm sorry, but eyelids don't look at anything, amen? Eyelids do not look at it. The eyeball looks at stuff. The eyelids close off the look. Oh, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute, God, what? Is that what you're trying to tell us? Help me to see that though the first part is talking about concentrating on what is right, this part about the eyelids looking straight before thee is talking about cover it from what is wrong. Cover it from what is wrong. You see, the eyelids cover the eye. And when we close the eyelids, we don't see, do we? We don't see what's out there. We need to cover our eyes from what is wrong. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Remember there in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 18, what he said that the word, binding the word to our hand would do. It would be as frontless between our eyes. It's a focusing of the eyes. We need to see that Just as important as concentrating on what is right, not looking at what is wrong is just as important. And it's hard in these days. Things that we shouldn't see are everywhere. In this day and age of people wearing very little clothing when it gets warm, we're seeing more flesh than people have seen very much in history. We, we're, I mean, you go to the grocery store and they got the, 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 the bikini uh, swimsuit edition right there in front for your children to see. It's hard, but we can. You see, the, the seeing it doesn't necessarily bring the sin. It's when we start focusing on it. I saw something, but instead of turning away, I kept looking. Or I turned away, but then I turned back. That's all of a sudden, now we're moving into sin realm. We're starting to look at the sin. We're starting to let it start to filter into our heart. Guess what, folks? I know you know this, but let's be reminded. The eyes are the windows of the heart. 
The eyes are the windows of the heart. What we see will go in. And in that fortification, part of that fortification is we need to cover up from what is wrong. We need to cover them eyes. What I mean, listen, <laughs> you might think, preacher, you're being a little silly here. Am I? When we go into the grocery store and that sign is there, what's wrong with doing this? Oh, people think I'm weird. Let them. Isn't it better to be thought weird than to have your heart corrupted? What about the, you know, the, they used to do it in the old days, grabbing the kids and putting your hands over their eyes. Oh, I, I don't want to embarrass my children. I think it'd be rather to embar better to embarrass our children than to let their hearts be corrupted. We need to understand, listen, all of us have seen that stupid advertisement on 465. I don't understand why that garbage is allowed. But as we come, we know where it's at now. The first time, this ha I, I mean, first time I ever saw it, I'm in the truck with Brother Danford and Brother Joshua, and we're driving, and Brother Danford all of a sudden says, eyes down, and I'm like, what is he talking about? <laughs> and I saw it, and I'm like, oh, that's what he's talking about. And so that's what we do. Everybody eyes down as we travel past. I keep my eyes straight forward. And when I know we're past, all right, you can look up again. We got to protect ourselves. You got to do whatever it takes. Listen, cover it up. The Bible says you can use the word of God to cover it up. You use your hands to cover it up. You turn your eyes from what it is. Close the eyelids, cover it up so that that garbage does not enter into our hearts. Verse 26, not only do we need to, uh, need to uh, uh, fortify it and flush it and then focus it, but we need to forecast it there in verse 26. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. The ponder there of course, has to do with thinking. But what is it thinking about? Ponder the path of thy feet. He's saying the way that you're going, you need to look down that path. You need to see what the end result of that path is. Is it a closer relationship with God? Or I should say fellowship with God? Or is it a drawing away from God? Is it a greater fellowship with your church family? Or is it a, a drawing away from your church family? Is it a better relationship with your wife, your husband, your children? Or is it drawing you further away? Most of all, am I getting more like Christ or further away from Him? We need to forecast. We're not prophets. But you know, especially adults and, and children... I'm not trying to belittle you, but that's why God gave you parents is because you have not enough experience. The older you're getting, the more experience you're getting. You know, Carissa has a lot more experience than Jesse does. Why? Because she's older than Jesse. But she still don't have near as much experience as her parents have. Amen? And so what does God give parents for? Because parents can see the path their children are taking and say, let me warn you, don't go down that path. But parents, and all that we know, we need to do the same thing for ourselves, and we need to realize God has more experience than us. And so we need to go to God and say, Lord, help me to see the end results of my path. The way that I'm going right now, will it bring me closer to you or not? The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 3, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. Now listen, I, I studied that verse there because uh, there's some things in there for this, uh, you know, for prepping, amen? There's some things in there on that. But as I studied that, what I found is that it's not like, oh, there's evil, I'm scared, I'm running away. No, 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 no. It's seen. There's something there that is too strong for me. 
And therefore, I'm going to run to the rock that is higher than I. I'm going to be that coney that I'm going to get down into that rock. And I'm going to get down in where it's, I'm safe. And I'm going to let Jesus put his wings over me. Amen. And I'm going to be safe from this harm. And I'm going to be sheltered from the harm. And I'm going to be strengthened while I'm there so that I can go out and face something strong. But now I'm strengthened for it. It's not being afraid of it. It's just be recognizing I can't deal with that. Listen, folks, listen. My wife said in her testimony, we are no match for the devil. Not on our own, we're not. We are no match for the devil. Now, with Jesus, we can take him on. Amen? But we don't need to get prideful because it's not us really taking him on. It's the Lord. We're just fighting our part of it. But there's a lot of evil out there that we get prideful thinking, I can handle that. I can handle that. Oh, I, I can handle that magazine on that shelf. I can look at that, and it's not going to hurt me. Oh, I, I, I can handle that music. It's not going to affect me. I, I can handle this uh, movie. It's not going to affect me. Pride coming before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We better recognize that we can't handle it. We are weak. And therefore, we need to have a forecasting. We need to foresee the evil and hide ourselves. I can see on this path that I take this path, I'm going to end up in some evil spots. I need to hide myself. I can see in this path that if I take this path, I'm going to get further away from Jesus. Therefore, I need to go this other path. Now, this path here, I'm getting closer to Jesus, but there's some evil out there. Even on the right path, there's some evil. Therefore, I need to hide myself in the rock. So in this, how do we forecast our path? And how do we forecast this in our heart? First of all, you need to consider your path. He says there, ponder the path of thy feet. Consider your path. But secondly, he says, and let all your ways be established. We need to confirm our ways. What, is that, what do I mean by that? The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We need to confirm our ways with the light of the word. Is this a scriptural path for a child of God? Or does it go contrary to God's will? I say again, the Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. The Christian life is supposed to be a life of faith. Now, faith is not something we can't understand. It's very simple. I've said it this many times. Faith is nothing more than obeying the revealed will of God. Notice that I did not say you totally understand the revealed will of God. You're just obeying the revealed will of God. When Abraham, brother Thomas and I were talking about this, taking him home today, when Abraham uh, went up on the mount with his uh, uh, son and he was going to uh, uh, sacrifice him because God told him to, he was walking in faith. He was obeying what God told him. He knew this was what God said, but he didn't understand it. He didn't understand it. I mean, this is the, this is the child that you told me is going to be the seed. I don't understand this, but I'm doing it. What does the New Testament tell us about that? He did that, even though he didn't understand the whys, he did it knowing that God could raise him from the dead if he wanted to. He had faith. He believed God. He just didn't understand it all. Folks, there's a lot of things that are easy to know what God is telling us to do. The hard part is understanding the whys. But, you know, when I was growing up, <laughs> my parents, specifically my mother, had a saying. When she would tell me to do something, and I'd say, why? She'd say, why is a crooked letter and you can't straighten it out? That's why. <laughs> and I always like, why? What? What do you mean by that? Amen? It's because she said so. That's why. 
You don't ask questions. You just do. You don't have to understand. You just do. And then you can ask later for an understanding. And sometimes you get it. Sometimes you don't. But here's the thing. We need to confirm it. This word is full of God's path for us. It's full of it. But how often do we get in it and examine the path we are on? How often do we get in the book and ask God, Lord, show me if I'm on the right path. Show me if my path is a path of righteousness or a path to wickedness. We need to forecast it. And then lastly, in verse 27, Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. We need to fix it. And by that, I don't mean repair it. We need to cement our feet. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 106, I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Remember, we just read there, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David follows that up with the verse 106. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. You know what David was doing? He was cementing his feet on the path. He's saying, I'm not budging from this path. This is the path I will take. Now listen, funny thing about cement, it can be broken. But it's not easy. Especially seasoned cement. The longer the cement is in its position, the harder it is to break it. When we were in Colorado... Uh, in our backyard, we had this great big huge uh, cement slab. I mean, big thing. The, the, the property there had been a big sawmill operation at one point, and that's where the saw had sat. And we had decided to put solar panels in and bring solar into our home. And so, uh, man, it was a big old array of solar panels. But to do that, we had to remove about half of this cement slab to give them the room where they wanted to put the solar panels. And so I went out and bought a jackhammer, amen, or not bought one, but rented one. And JP and I, we went to work. I got video of JP. <laughs> but I, I, in my mind, I had this thought, jackhammer, cement, no match for the jackhammer. It's going down. Oh, my word, it was hard work. It did not bust up like I thought it was going to. Why? That cement had been there for probably 45 to 50 years. It was well seasoned, and it wasn't going to come apart real easy. Folks, listen. The longer you keep your feet cemented in the path, the harder it will be for your flesh and for the devil to break it up and get you out of it. But it's got to begin by cementing it there in the first place. Fixing yourself. Then we find, uh, as well with that, he goes on, turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Then he says, remove thy foot from evil. So you don't only got to cement your feet to be fixed, you got to correct your errors. Let me ask, is any of us error-free in this building? <laughs> I made a lot of errors in my life, a lot of errors. Talking with the inmates today, you know, it's, it's, it's good to let them know we don't think we're better than you just because we're in suits and ties. We, we are sinners, and we've made a lot of mistakes. And, you know, if there's some of them. If I'd have been caught, I'd probably be in jail with you today. Amen? So, folks, listen, there's errors in our life. And here's the, here's the issue with errors is too often the problems, the, 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 the sin. Let's just call it what it is. The Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The sins in our life, those errors, if we don't get them out of our life, 
we just cover it up a little bit, it's going to come back up. The Bible talks about every root of bitterness. Think about a root. Those weeds that we're trying to pull all the time in the gardens and all that. What well, I mean, you can pull up a, a, a you know, 300 rows of weeds. The very next day, you're going to come out and watch there, weeds. Why? Because we didn't get the root. We've got to correct the errors, not just cover them up, not just pluck them down to the root where nobody can see them, but the root's still there. We, we can't just say, well, nobody else knows about it. We got to confront it. We got to confess it. And we got to correct it. But too often, you know what hinders us from doing that? Pride. Pride. You know, David talks about how blessed the man is who doesn't cover up his sin. Gets the forgiveness from God that he needs. We can't cover up our sin. We've got to correct it. Listen to this, Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. If we're not broken over our sin, and we don't come before God with a contrite heart, full of repentance, then we're not correcting the error. We're covering it. And sooner or later, it's going to come back. I don't know how many times I've experienced this in my own life. Just cover it up. Cover it up. I won't do that anymore. But I'm not really going to be the contrite heart. I'm just going to cover it up. I won't do that no more. And lo and behold, it might be a week. It might be a year. It might be five years. Down the road, here comes that weed sticking itself back up through my soil. We got to correct it. As I stated this morning in the introduction, the heart is the battleground. Satan is putting stuff in front of each of us to see, to hear, and to say so that you and I will lose our heart. Remember, we're talking about keeping our heart. God has given you his Holy Spirit, and he has given you his word to help you and I overcome. Each of us have the tools needed to do the fight. We have the steps that are here in these verses. Now you and I just have to make a decision. Are we going to obey the word and follow the steps to keep our heart? Or are we going to in pride say, I can do it on my own? Brother Joshua was telling me about an inmate in the jail that they've had several opportunities to try to help. And man says he's saved and, and has got a good testimony of how he got saved and all that. And he told Brother Joshua, he said, I used to be like you guys, the suits and all that, in church all the time. I used to be like that. He says, and one day... I was sitting on my front porch, and I was looking out, and I was thinking about all that I had accomplished. And I, he said, I had that thought, look what I've done. Who else had that kind of thought? Nebuchadnezzar, right? And all of a sudden, his life is in shambles, and he's in jail. His son has died. And he realizes it began when he lifted up his heart in pride. Folks, you and I, we have no reason at all to be prideful. Not one. We are wicked. There is no good thing in us. We, we, are, we are destructive. We, we, we are not helpful most of the time. I mean, we're just wicked. It's only the grace of God 
that we are what we, I mean, think, uh, is that what Paul said? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Any good thing in me today is the grace of God. So I have nothing to be prideful about, but I have everything to be thankful about. Let's examine ourselves and be willing to say, God, I need you to help me know, am I on the right path? Am I keeping my heart or am I doing things that are letting it go? Letting Satan steal it. Letting this world steal it. Young people, please, please. You're at a moment in your life, you teenagers especially. There's so much drawing on your heart today. Friends, family, your phones, what you're seeing that, there, that is being portrayed by the world that is what, you know, is right. Get your eyes on Jesus. Focus your heart on God. And go down the right path to keep your heart. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Lord, that we would, God, be serious with you on this. Lord, each of us, Lord, can be on the wrong path. Help us, God, to fortify our hearts. Help us, Lord, to flush our hearts. God, I pray that you'd help us to focus our hearts. Lord, help us to fix them. Lord, I pray that, God, you'd help us to stay with you, to not let our heart be stolen. In Jesus' name, amen. As the piano